also the other way around that, that supercomputing can gain from uh, our understanding of the brain. So first of all, we know that um, uh, the neuroscience field needs supercomputing. We have a lot of data. Uh, it's fragmented and, and we lack uh, this mechanistic uh, understanding of the brain. And one way to improve that is, is of course, to, to um, uh, try to do a multi-scale integration of, of the knowledge and data that we have, and then modeling and simulations of various aspects of the brain is, is a way forward. And sometimes that also requires uh, real-time time simulations, or sometimes even uh, simulation that goes faster than that, because if we want to uh, study development or plasticity learning and so on, we might not want to wait as long as it takes in, in reality, so we might even want to go beyond real-time simulations. And this we will hear about, uh, represented by, by the speakers today, how, how to speed up the simulations as, as much as possible. Also, it's the other way around that uh, future computing will gain from uh, our improved understanding of the brain. So we already know that our brains have amazing information capabilities and they are much more energy uh, efficient than today's computers and also they are robust, fault tolerant and they can adapt to, to a changing environment and all of these things we can um, get inspiration from when, when um, uh, trying to, to develop future computing technologies. And we will also hear examples of that uh, during the workshop, how to um, implement more brain-like capabilities on, onto neuromorphic uh, computing systems. So we have four talks, 20, 25 minutes each, uh, which will uh, exemplify these things. Um, we will um, hear about um, the challenge to simulate a, a large part of the cerebellum. That means that we have to really have efficient uh, sim uh, systems. We will also hear how, how a simulation tool called Brian can, can um, help us when we want to switch between different platforms in an efficient way. <clears throat> and we will also hear how, how uh, neuromorphic engineering systems can, can be inspired by the, how the brain works. And also we will get exemplified how, how uh, we can enhance neuromorphic systems with brain-like uh, capabilities such as learning and plasticity. Okay, so the first speaker is um, Tadashi Yamasaki. And he has a PhD in computer science from Tokyo Institute of Technology. Uh, and then he was a research scientist at the Riken Brain Science Institute. And now he is an assistant professor of mathematical information sciences at the University of Electrocommunication in Tokyo. That's it. Thank you for kind introduction, and I'd like to thank the organizers of this congress for inviting me to this world, this congress, uh, the organizers for inviting me to this congress. Because actually, this is my first time to visit Australia, so I'm very excited about this. So, it's a big thank you for you all. And uh, today, I'd like to talk about the cerebellum. Most of you know that the cerebellum is this one, this small one. Yeah, this one. And actually, this is small. The cerebellum is a Latin word meaning the small brain. It's actually it's small. It only occupies the 10% of the whole brain volume. So it's small. However, the cerebellum contains about 80% of neurons in the whole brain. So it makes me the cerebellum really attractive. So cerebellum does something very useful using this enormous number of neurons. That's the point. 
Another important thing of the cerebellum is that the spontaneous firing rate be, is very high compared to the cerebral cortical neurons. So if, this means that even when we are just resting, our cerebellum is doing something very useful for some purposes. So it's a kind of mystery. So what does the cerebellum do? Traditionally, the cerebellum is thought to play an important role for motor learning and motor control. And these days, however, several lines of evidence suggest that the cerebellum is involved even for cognitive functions such as working memory. And in our current understanding, the cerebellum is thought to learn or acquire internal models and use it for these tasks. Let me explain what an internal model is and how, does the, how the cerebellum uses it for these tasks. The pink boxes uh, represent uh, higher motor cortices and uh, primary motor cortex, somatosensory cortices, and uh, some controlled body parts, such as an arm. This is a schematic of uh, uh, feedback error learning proposed by Dr. Kabato many years ago. So these pink regions represent uh, some feedback control of our body parts. The higher motor area plan a desired movement, and uh, primary motor cortex generates a motor command to achieve the this desired movement, and the motor command generate moves the actual body part, such as an arm. The, uh, the desired movement was fed, is fed back to the primary motor cortex to be uh, the sensory cortex. So this is a feedback control. And uh, the green box is the cerebellum, and the cerebellum is attached like this and sharing the same input from the higher motor cortex with this primary motor cortex. The cerebellum learns an internal model of the primary motor cortex, which is the table of input and output relationship of the primary motor cortex. So actually, the cerebellum can try to mimic the dynamics of the primary motor cortex. And after the learning, the cerebellum offloads the computation performed by the primary motor cortex originally, and it, it replaces the feedback control with feed-forward control by this mechanisms. So this is what the cerebellum is thought to do in our current understanding. So the role of the cerebellum may be the computation offloading of the uh, primary motor cortex or uh, cerebral cortex. How is the cerebral circuit? This is an uh, illustration of, of uh, cerebral cortical nuclear microcomplex. This is, a, this is thought to be the from functional module of the cerebellum. The microcomplex is composed of just seven major types of neurons. They are granule cells, Golgi cells, Purkinje cells, stellar cells, basket cells, and uh, inferior olivary cells, and cerebral nuclear neurons. And I, I, already, I already told that the cerebellum contains about 80% of neurons in the whole brain, and most of them are cerebral granule cells. They are the smallest neurons in the whole brain, and the number is enormous. Actually, they are, the soma size is just five micrometer, and they are densely packed, as dense as one million neurons per one cubic millimeter. So the cerebellum is composed of many small, tiny computational elements, granule cells. Moreover, the cerebellum has a modular organization of microcomplexes. So the cerebellum is organized by copy and paste of these microcomplexes, and the whole of the cerebellum is generated. So, summarizing, the functional role of the cerebellum is the computational offloading of the cerebral cortex, and the structure is a many core architecture composed of cerebral granule cells and has a modular organization of microcomplexes. So these properties remind us the graphics processing unit. This is a figure of NVIDIA uh, graphics GPU, maybe a K20, perhaps. And uh, in GPU, the computational Functional module is a uh, streaming marriage processor, and one marriage process, streaming marriage processor is composed of uh, many computational elements called the quads. And a uh, whole the GPU is a cut, copy and paste of the streaming marriage processors. So we may say that if the cerebral cortex was a, G, was a CPU, then the cerebrum would be a GPU. This is my first message. I have been building a very large-scale spiking network model of the cerebellum to date. And uh, next, I will explain how I implement it and uh, how we conduct the numerical simulation efficiently. So this is a schematic of the cerebellum model that I, we have been building. 
And that's uh, actually a model of one cube millimeter of the cerebellum, and so it con contains uh, more than one million granule cells. And we also contain some other types of neurons with these numbers, and they are modeled as conductance-based leaky internet and fire units. The neurons are connected according to the anatomy cats, anatomical data, and the cell parameters are, take, are taken from er er rodents electrophysiological data. It's kind of a realistic ne network. Moreover, there are two plasticity sites. One is at parallel fiber Parkin cell synapses, and which undergo long-term depression, or LTD, by conjunctive activation of parallel fibers and climbing fiber. The other site is uh, around here, uh, mostly around here, mostly fiber uh, cerebral nuclear cell synapses, which undergo both bidirectional direction, uh, both bidirectional plasticity, both LTP and LTD, by some Fabian mechanisms. So once we build uh, this kind of model, we need to conduct a numerical simulation. This is a general pseudo code of uh, computer simulation for a neural network. Most, uh, sorry, most of you know that this kind of code. The outer loop represents this. This is a loop for time. And for each time step, we need to calculate some neuron dynamics. The inner loop represents a loop for neurons. And for each neuron, uh, and for each time step, we calculate the first synaptic conductance and update uh, the increment of membrane potential, and we update all the neuron states. And these three steps must be done uh, sequentially. But if we focus on this calculation, the calculation of one, this calculation of just one neuron is independent with, of other neurons. So using GPUs, we can parallelize this part uh, with respect to the neurons. Here note that we cannot calculate different, we cannot perform different calculations on different GPUs or different GPU cores. All the GPU cores must perform the same calculation with, on different data sets. So this kind of uh, computation is called single instruction and multiple thread, or SIMT for short. So once again, the same calculation on different data sets must be performed on the GPU. So of course this is a limitation. We cannot compute any Kind of com we cannot perform any kind of calculations on GPUs. We must, we must perform only the same calculation on the, all, all, on the all GPU cores. So this is a limitation, but SIMT is actually ideal for the cerebral model uh, by the following reasons. The obvious bottleneck of uh, com uh, computer simulation of our, granular, of our cerebral model is, of course, one million granule cells. And all the granule cells obey the same dynamical equations. So we can just perform the same calculation. And of course, cell parameters are different across neurons, so they are different data sets. And uh, we have some other neurons, of course, Golgi cells or protein cells and so on, but the num their numbers are much, much smaller than the granule cells, so their effects are very negligible. So SIMT is ideal for our cellular model, and so GPU is very very good for simulating the uh, cerebral network. We have been using four GPUs simultaneously. Actually, we used two NVIDIA GeForce Titan Z, and uh, each Titan Z board contains two GeForce Titan, so we use four GPUs efficiently. And using these four GPUs simultaneously, we achieve a real-time simulation, where real-time means that uh, computer simulation of cerebral activity for one second finishes within one second in real-world time with temporal resolution of one mill, just one millisecond. So this is very nice. And uh, for further information, my student Masato will explain, you, explain to you at uh, his poster afternoon after the workshop. So please ask him. The poster number is P06. Now I will introduce some applications of our, of our cerebral model. So real-time computing has at least two benefits. One is that real-time signal processing is possible, which is necessary for some engineering applications such as robotics. The, the other merit is that we can conduct a very long-time computer simulation, maybe for days or weeks, in a practical and realistic time. So the first example is uh, some batting robot. It's just a demonstration. It's not so very 
uh, interesting from the engineering viewpoint, but anyway, let me explain. So this is a robot. It has a, some fan or a butt, and behind the robot there is a, some back net. And around here, there is a, some toy pitching machine, and the pitching machine throws a small ball. And the robot tries to hit the bat by this fan or bat, but of course he, the robot fails. When the robot fails to hit the ball, the ball hits the back net. And the, when the ball hits the back net, there is a, a sensor attached to the back net, and uh, that detects the error. So using this error information, our cerebral model learns the correct timing to swing the bat. So the task is learning the correct timing of when the ball comes and uh, when the robot should swing the bat to hit the ball that, uh, correctly. And this is actually an um, analogy of the eyebrow conditioning. Eyebrow conditioning is uh, some experimental paradigm to st which is used to study the cerebral timing mechanisms. So let me show you some movie. And uh, first time, the robot does nothing. And during training, robots start to swing the bat, but still it delays. And after enough time, robot can hit the ball. Maybe once again. So fails. So swings, but still fails, still delays. And after that, robot learns the correct time to hit the ball. So this is just a demonstration of real-time signal processing using our cerebral model. So it may not, might not be so interesting, but anyway. So another example is that we can conduct very long-time computer simulation for, to, to understand the memory formation process within the cerebellum. Memory formation has at least two stages. The first stage is some memory acquisition, which occurs during training. And the second stage is memory consolidation, which occurs after training to consolidate learned memory. Dr. Nagao and his colleagues uh, showed these two, two stage processes very, by very beautiful experiments. They adopted gain adaptation of the optokinetic response and eye reflex, and uh, they trained mice every day for one, by one hour daily training. And by one hour daily training, the OKR gain, uh, OKR gain is uh, some amplitude of the eye movement. The OKR gain increases from here to here. And after the training, the animals go to the cage, go, animal go to the cage and just relax. So the land again disappears or disappears. And the next day, again, one of our training and the OKR gain increases. And after that, the land again disappears. So you can see that this gain increase represents the memory acquisition during the training. And you can see that the OKR gain gradually increases throughout the five days. So this process represents post-training uh, memory consolidation. The memory post-training memory consolidation is very interesting because during the memory consolidation, animals do nothing. They're just resting. Even when the animals are just resting, their cerebellum is doing something to consolidate learned memory. So I'm interested in the, what the mechanisms or a process of the post-training memory consolidation, and I conducted a very long-term computer simulation using our model. Basically, the computer simulation is very slow. It may take, it sometimes it takes 100 times slower than real-time. But thanks to the real-time computing using multi-GPUs, we can conduct this computer simulation of one week motor learning training within just one week. So we calculate, we continuously calculated this sim computer simulation using one week. And a left figure shows the simulated OKR gain, and you can see that the OKR gain increases by one hour training, and after that, the gain disappears. But throughout the five days, round the gain gradually increases. And the right panel, uh, and this is consistent with the experimental data. The right panel shows the simulated eye movement trajectory and before, the, before and after the training at first day, second day, third day, fourth day, and fifth day. And this is also consistent with experimental data of eye movement trajectory. So we can successfully, we, we were able to successfully reproduce uh, eye movement uh, OKR gain change for one week, it's a very long time. 
And note that the temporal resolution is just one millisecond. So it's very long term. And again, uh, the master will explain the details by his poster about this issue. So please ask him. So maybe uh, I'm almost finishing, and let me discuss the challenges and future directions of neuromorphic computing. I think there are two directions. One is the engineering applications, such as robotics, whereas the real-time computing is a key issue. And the other is some scientific tool. So we, use, we develop a model as a scientific tool to conduct, to, to, bet, to obtain a better understand, to obtain a better understanding of how the brain works. And in this part, in this case, we need much finer spatial, we need a model which has finer spatial scale and finer temporal scale. It must be very large, realistic, and detailed, elaborated model. So, of course, so there are two directions, but I think that pursuing both directions is very important. And closing the loop between the science and the engineer is very important to obtain the better understanding of what the brain computes and how does the brain works. So that's almost all of my talk, but let me have some announcement. So next month, we, ha uh, we have an annual conference of Japanese Neural Network Society, and we'll have a special session on neuromorphic computing and high-performance computing with these speakers. And they will talk about cake supercomputer and FPGA. Uh, it's a programmable hardware. And uh, Spinnaker, it's a dedicated neuromorphic chip and GPUs. And after this session, we'll have an invited talk entitled Neuromorphic Computing in IBM by Dr. Koichi Kajitani from IBM Research Japan. And he will talk about the IBM's latest neuromorphic chip, TrueNose, which was published in Science last year. So we are very excited about this talk. And if you are interested in these issues, please join us next month in Tokyo. Okay. So finally, I'd like to thank my collaborators and funding. So thank you for your attention. So we have time for some questions. Uh, maybe I missed something, but wh what's the uh, plasticity model, synapse model, neural model you see in your system? Plasticity. Yes, and uh, synapse and the neural. Um, okay, um, we have two plasticity sites, and uh, this is one. One is parallel fiber parking cell synapses the synaptic weight undergoes long-term depression by the conjunctive activation of parallel fibers and the climbing fiber. I say parallel fiber conveys some contextual information, and the climbing fiber conveys error information. It's a kind of error running. And another plasticity is a mossy fiber cerebral nuclear cell synapses. This is just heavy unlearning. Is that OK? So for your neural model, that's all single compartment? Single compartment, yes. So your real time is based on this single compartment model. Real time, you, you claim that you can do real time simulation. Yeah, real time uh, simulation. Ro roughly one million neurons. One million, yeah. That's single all single compartment. compartment. Yes. Okay, thank you. And how many synapses per neuron is uh, connected? Mm, one per cell. We have actually 16 per cell, and one per cell have a 0.2 million synapses. 200,000 synapses for each Perkin cell. Okay, thank you. And we have 16 Perkin cell. So actually, I also had a, a follow up question on the plasticity out of curiosity. So, can you get away with just LTD between parallel fibers and? Purkinje cells, or you have to have some mechanism that reverse that. Could you say it again? Yeah. So you ha you said you had um, plasticity between the parallel fibers and mm -hmm. the Purkinje cells, LTD. Yeah. Yeah. Can you get away with only downregulating the oh, synaptic connectivity? I see. I see. I see. Actually, there is a um, LTP also. 
And LTP is induced by sole activation of parallel fibers. But I just omitted this explain, explanation. Sorry. Because okay. we need to recover the, the depressed synapses to the normal level by for some purposes. So actually both direction and both plasticities are included. Okay. Thank you. And then we go to the next speaker. <laughs>